And that whatever's happening in the world, Lord, doesn't surprise you. You are taking history somewhere. And our desire, Lord, is to be aligned with you. Our desire, Lord, is to be one with you. So we come to ask you to restore our union, Lord. Restore our relationship. Deepen our understanding of who you are and the plans that you have for us and for this world. But Lord, also we come to intercede on behalf of so many brokenness that's going on in our world right now. We come, Lord, to petition, Lord, to intercede, to pray, Lord, over the nation of Israel, to pray, Lord, that you would meet their needs today, that you would comfort those who are mourning today. There are families who are wondering about their loved ones who were taken hostage, Lord. We pray, be with them, Lord. Or we're asking you in the middle of this chaos that you would perform some miracles, God. We're praying, Lord, for praise reports to come out of this war. We're praying, Lord, that this war will lead many to repentance, to turn to you, Jesus, as the Lord and Savior. We also pray for the Palestinians. We pray for the Gaza Strip. Oh, we can't imagine what it feels to be trapped in a place with no water and no solution. Father, we pray you are the living water. You are the bread of life. We pray over the people of Gaza Strip right now. Meet them where they are, Lord. God, give us a perspective of your presence that is greater than allies or enemies, Lord. We are here to pray for the world. We're here to intercede on behalf of the Ukrainians, Lord, and pray, Lord, for your peace and pray for your strength and pray for your guidance. Lord, we also lift up our own government, Lord. We pray for our president. Give him wisdom. Give him insight, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you wake him up, Lord, and give him, give him dreams and revelations of your will and your purpose. Bless his cabinet, Lord. Bless our Congress, Lord. Help our people, Lord. Help your nation, we pray. Lord, your word says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, that you would hear our prayer and you would restore our land. Lord, have mercy on our land. Pour out your spirit upon this nation, Lord. We need your presence. We need your goodness. We need your mercy. And Father, in this room, there are needs that only you can meet, Lord. We pray, Lord, we lift up all our friends to you right now. And we say, Lord, let your kingdom come to each one and let your will be done upon each life. Give us this day our daily bread, Lord. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours alone, Lord, is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And we pray with gratitude in Jesus' name. If you believe it, give God a shout of praise in this place. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. We are coming out of an amazing men's retreat. It was at a powerful time. So, excuse me if I'm a little hungover this morning. There is such thing as spiritual hungover. The ones that you have no regrets. The ones that you thank God that he did what he did. And you know God is real when a bunch of grown men get together and we worship Jesus for an hour straight and men are crying, men are embracing. You know that's God because the only time men do that, they're either drunk or they're filled with the Holy Spirit. We were filled with the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody. If you have your Bibles, we are in Romans chapter 12 as we continue our marathon series. And if you are interested in knowing more about biblical prophecies and where we are in the world and what Jesus has to say, this Tuesday we will continue to talk about that. And what I like to do this Tuesday is to unpack the difference between the religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Because if you understand the conflict, it's not a natural conflict, it's a spiritual conflict. It's a matter of who you worship. And I want to say this to us as a church, that we don't study the Bible to have a feeling of superiority. We study the Bible to have the heart of God for people of all nations, of all countries, of all ethnicity. God loves the world and he wants to rescue people. Can you say amen? amen? Romans chapter 12, beginning with verse 9. So in Romans 12, right, we said we 
we shifted, Paul shifts his attention to how now do you live the Christian life? Now that you know that Jesus Christ has offered himself for you, he says, now offer your bodies to him. Become a living sacrifice that is holy and pleasing to him. And so now he turns his attention to how we do that with each other. How do we become godly people to each other? How do we live in community with each other? And Paul takes his time to unpack how do we do that. Basically, Romans 12 through 16 is about our relationship with one another. But also, to next Sunday, we'll talk about how do we relate to those we don't agree with. How do we relate to our enemies? Because Jesus said, pray for your enemies, love your enemies. Don't take revenge, says the Lord. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. So we'll talk about that next week. But today we're going to talk about how do we coexist as a godly community. Can you say amen? So Romans 12, beginning with verse 9, says this. It says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal. But keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. That is the word of the Lord. Can you say amen? So today we're going to focus on these principles. It's interesting that the way Paul lays this out, he's taking the Proverbs approach. He's giving you some, some zingers, some quick, you know, wisdom to go by. And so I want to unpack these six principles here of how we're supposed to relate to one another. These, in other words, for these is Christian ethics. This is how you actually show that you have the heart of Christ, how you show that you have the heart of Jesus. And we know this, that, that these Principles are going to be challenged because life brings challenges. There's going to be difficult seasons. There's going to be difficult relationships. And the Bible is trying to give you principles to live by when your relationships are being tested. Can you say amen? amen. So let's get into it. The first thing that Paul says, he says, love must be sincere. Love must be sincere. What's interesting there, the word sincere in the Greek is hinting a love is not hypocritical. In other words, for hypocritical is love is not phony. Love is not manipulative. It's not controlling. Deeper, when you have sincere love, you don't look to take advantage of others. My friends, we have to have sincere love. Sincere love is not flattery. Flattery is manipulation in disguise. Flattery is wrong motives. And one of the things we have to be careful with as people of God is we have to be careful with our religious jargon. If you've been here, you've heard me say this, we have to be careful with Christianese, where we say a lot of religious things. Glory to God, praise the Lord, brother, hallelujah. But do you mean it? Do you actually mean what you're saying? Because, my friends, as God's people, our love must be sincere, which means we have to mean what we say and say what we actually mean. Because... It's possible to hide behind religious jargon. Let me give you an example. When Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross, the Bible tells us that he was in the garden praying, and Judas came to him, and Judas betrays him with a kiss. Now, if you know that culture, a kiss is a sign of greeting, is a sign of honor, is a sign of respect. I grew up kissing grown man. In my culture, it was normal, and then we moved here, and I got older. I told my dad, it's weird, like, dad, like, <laughs> they don't do that here in America. 
But I grew up kissing my dad. I grew up kissing my uncles. I grew up kissing those who are older than you. It's a symbol of love. It's a symbol of respect and honor. And here Judas is using a beautiful symbol, but he's betraying him. And Jesus' response always fascinates me in that moment. Jesus kisses him as a sign of betrayal, and Jesus responds with, Friend, why do you betray me with a kiss? That always goes right through me. That Jesus is like, I know what you're doing, but I'm not going to reciprocate it. And I believe that's the moment that broke Judas. I believe that's the moment that led Judas to remorse instead of repentance. And he took matters into his own hands. My friends, it's one thing to do an action, but is your motives pure? Are your intentions right? Because love must be sincere. See, love is a verb, my friends. It's not a feeling. It's an action. See, if love is sincere, then love must confront what's insincere. If love is sincere, then I must confront problems. I must confront sin. I must confront what's evil in me, but also in my relationships. Because here's the thing about love, right? Love is doing what God says even when you don't feel like it. We have a saying in this church that it is principles over feelings. A great theologian said, facts don't care about your feelings. Love in action must be sincere. It's interesting because the Bible goes on to say here that you should hate what is evil and cling to what is good. That's what love does. Love makes you hate what is evil and cling to what is good. In other words, you got to love what God loves. you got to hate what God hates. See, my friends, right now, there is this false love called tolerance. Tolerance is not love. Tolerance is a lack of tough love. Tolerance is a lack of discernment. Right? If I truly love you, I will tell you the truth. Right? I'm not going to sugarcoat the truth for you if I really genuinely love you. If you genuinely love someone and you see them doing something that's not good for them, you don't join them and go, let me help you dig your own grave. You try to take the shovel away, and you try to lead them to life. You try to lead them to wisdom. You try to lead them to something that is real. <laughs> See, what's interesting is what Paul is doing is, 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 is uh, brilliant because he's showing you that love and hate are allies. Because when you love, you hate. Let me give you a couple of examples. Parents, do you love your children? You're like, on, depends on the day, right? Because you love your children, you hate predators. If you don't hate predators, what's wrong with you? You don't really love your children. Married people, do you love your spouse? You're like, uh, pastor, what day is it? What, what, what's going on? If you love your marriage, you hate divorce. The Bible says God hates divorce. Why? Because God loves marriages. He loves families. He loves people to stay together and fight together to thick and thin to hell and water comes. If you love, you also hate. Because they're allies. The thing is this. The reason why he's putting these two together is to help you understand that love can distort your view of good and evil. Sometimes a strong emotional connection to someone makes you not think right. You end up doing things that you wouldn't normally do if you were level-headed. Think about this. We have songs like this. If, you, <laughs> if loving you is wrong, then I don't want to be. That's not love. That's infatuation. That's a problem. Someone should call a psychiatrist. <laughs> because, because love is a strong emotion and it needs to be counteracted with principles. 
so you don't find yourself in a place that you shouldn't be. Parents, you love your children, right? And sometimes you have a hard time disciplining your kids. Why? Because you don't like how they feel. Like, I hate seeing them sad and cry. You know what you should hate? You should hate them become spoiled and Barbies. <laughs> the Bible says, spare the rod. Kay Vernon's don't need that Bible verse. We, they, <laughs> they got that unlocked. I think Americans need that Bible verse. But he gets triggered. Yeah, he gets triggered, and he grows up, and he, you know, protests the wrong things. My friend, God hates. He hates, and he told you what he hates. Just to make sure, God's like, let me put it in my word what I hate, so you know. Look at this, Proverbs 6. God says this, right? We're going to go slow here. Hey, watch this. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. It's funny because he's like six more. Never mind, seven. <laughs> it's like, I've, I just remember one more thing. <laughs> I don't know how you read the Bible, but that, that's funny to me. It's like, six, wait, y'all are crazy. Let me add that one more thing. Look at these six things God hates, okay? One, God hates haughty eyes. What is haughty eyes? Arrogant, prideful, eyes who look down on others. God's like, I hate that. I didn't create you to think you're better than others. Second thing God hates, a lying tongue. Do I have to explain a lying tongue? <laughs> you know, the Bible says when you speak lies, you, you, are the, you, you are one with the father of lies, who is the devil. Number three, God hates hands that shed innocent blood. Do you think God takes lightly what took place in Israel? Justice is coming, my friends. No one's getting away with anything. Keep going. God hates a heart that devises wicked schemes. You know what wicked schemes is? Is, is doing something on the surface, but you have different motives. God hates wicked schemes. Listen, this is what the fear of the Lord is so powerful, because you could be doing something on the surface, but you have different motives. God's taking notice. Now, let me be a pastor for a second here. Sometimes dudes come to church, and they have wicked schemes to try to lure women to sleep with them. God knows that. And God will keep you accountable for that. And ladies, use your discernment. Okay? Use your discernment. My prayer as a father is, I want my kids to be so confident in who they are that they're not going to fall for flatteries. People use wicked schemes in business. People use wicked schemes in, 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 in interactions because you're trying to get something out of someone. God, God knows. No one's getting away with anything. But you better repent. Watch this. We'll keep going. A false witness who pours out lies. God hates when you falsely talk about other people. Right now in our, in our nation, in our generation, this is normal. It's called Facebook. You think God's not going to keep you accountable for your posts. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth tweets. God will keep us accountable for all of these things, my friends. Jesus said something that just sends chills on my spine. He says, one day you will be accountable for every word that you utter if you don't repent. So when you're lying about people, giving people a false understanding of other people because you're tainting their reputation, God hates it. And watch this, last one. God hates a person who stirs up conflict in the community. You know what that is? Divisive people. People always trying to take sides and hurt the community. God says, I hate that. And I will keep you accountable for that. My friends, we live in a day and age where people just think that they can say whatever. We have diarrhea in the mouth. Not thinking that we're not going to be held accountable. Listen, God is sovereign. God is omnipotent. God is omniscient. God knows everything. God sees everything. And he's telling you, I hate it. So cling to what is good. Hate what is evil. Can you say amen?
Then he keeps going. He says this, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Honor one another above yourselves. See, my friends, what Paul is trying to get to is help us understand that if we are in Christ, we are a family. And if we are a family, we should give each other grace. We should give each other room. In other words, here's a question that you should be asking if you're taking these words seriously. Is how can I lift your burdens? Because I love you. Because I I honor you because I care about you. See, we live in a society where it is, how can someone lift my burdens? But it's like, no, we, we are now God's people. We look to lift each other's burdens. A better way to look at it is, is we need to become each other's workout partners. Remember, the Bible says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Like, confession, I don't like going to the gym. The only way I would go to the gym is with a workout partner. Like a few years back, I used to go to the gym, not because I liked it, but because my partner. Pastor Julius, who is a pastor now in Fall River, I just met with him. He's doing great, by the way. I thank God for his life. We used to work out together, and I would pray, God, I hope he doesn't text me this morning. (laughs) Faithfully, he would text me at 5 in the morning. And that conviction, that accountability would come. I hated that, but I love the results. We need to keep each other accountable. We need to help each other. We need to be devoted to one another because it is the will of God that I lift your burden and you lift my burden and we help each other overcome things in the name of Jesus Christ by the power of his Holy Spirit. Look, he says honor. My friends, can, can we be honest for a second? Honor is lacking in our society. We have a lack of honor in our society. And what's sad about it is honor is a powerful, not just principle, it's a commandment. You know that the commandment says, honor your father and mother so your days on earth may be prolonged? Think about that. How many people have hijacked their own lives for lack of honor? How many people have short-circuited their blessings for lack of honor? My friends, this is very important because God is a God of principles. Listen, when honor goes up, blessings come down. When honor stops going up, blessings stop flowing. Sometimes we're blocking our own blessings because of our lack of honor, our lack of integrity, our lack of respect. Listen. I don't know what your political affiliation is, and I don't care because I'm neither Democrat or Republican, but man, the lack of honor for people in authority is, 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 is sickening. People talk about the president like he's a, a someone down the street. Don't you know, in Romans 13, we're going to get into it, God says, I put people in places of honor and authority. If you want your life to go well, you better honor them. You, listen, you don't have to like someone in authority to honor them. The principle is the principle, starting at home. I remember I didn't grow up in a Christian home. My dad got saved. I was 19, and he, and he, and he took that seriously. He began to teach us that church starts at home. Right. Learn to honor each other at home. Because if our kids learn to honor their parents, they'll learn to honor their teachers. They'll learn to honor police officers. They'll learn to honor people who are in a place of authority. I want to say this again because it's so important. When honor goes up, Blessings come down. You don't have to like someone in authority, but you, if you want to be blessed, learn to honor. See, the Bible says honor spiritual leaders because God put them in place. It's a powerful story in the Old Testament when, when David was being hunted by Saul. And he had every reason to dishonor Saul. He had every reason to kill Saul. And you know what he said? He says, I refuse to touch the Lord's anointed. That is a powerful principle that is lacking in our, in, our, in, our, in our lives right now. This guy was so principled by God that he's like, I have every right. It's my throne. God made him king. And he says, I refuse to touch the Lord's anointed. And today, what do we do? 
Anytime we have a problem with someone, we just blurt it out and we just put it out there. Right now, there are people who make a living on YouTube out of telling you who are the false teachers, who are the false prophets, clickbaits. My friends, it's sickening to make a living out of dishonor. It's sickening to just focus on people's negative moments. You know what I would love to do? What if we put a GoPro on you and we followed you around for 24 hours and then we came back and posted all your low lights? How would you like that? See, Jesus said, do unto others as you like to be done unto you. That's honor. That's respect. We're lacking that in our, you know, listen, you know what's crazy? Go read the end times. Don't miss the little things that Jesus says. Jesus said in the end times, one of the things you're going to know is that people will actually falsely accuse you, lie about you, mistreat you, persecute, and think they're doing God a favor. That's a lack of discernment. That's a lack of maturity. That's a lack of honor. It's a lack of respect. When, when the flood ended and Noah had a moment of weakness, you probably would too if you spent 40 days in an ark with smelly animals. <laughs> and he got drunk right off the bat. He's like, man, I... <laughs> and one of the kids was like, oh, look, dad. And you know what the other sons did? They're like, we're not going to dishonor dad. We're going to cover dad. We're going to bless dad. Listen, bless those who persecute you. Bless those who hurt you because God will bless you for being a blessing. <laughs> Listen, my friends. Give people the benefit of the doubt. We're so good at reading other people's minds. We're so good at knowing other people's motives. It's a scary place to be and to call ourselves mature because here's the defense that people use. Well, doesn't the Bible say to call out the false prophets and fall out? It's like, yeah, but did he tell you to make a living out of it? Did he tell you to make a ministry out of it? And, And why is it that you're so quick to always point out someone's weak moment but not show their full life. Isn't that interesting? You can do a thousand things right and you do one thing wrong and everybody wants to harp on that one thing. And it's like, what's wrong with us that we're so consumed with other people's negative moments? It's a lack of honor. It's a lack of respect. It's a lack of integrity, for lack of better words. Listen, this thing is hard. Doing ministry is extremely hard. I have such a heart for anyone who is trying to serve God because I know how hard it is. So in 10 years, you will never hear me badmouth another church, another pastor, another spiritual leader. I'd rather bless them than to curse them and trust God to take care of us. Now, if you've been here, you know we'll call out stuff that's false, but I don't have to put people on blast. God knows. Learn to honor each other. Don't jump to conclusions. That's another one. People jump to conclusions. One of the things we do, it's a lack of honor, is you talk about people instead of talking to the person you need to talk to. How many times that we should have a conversation with someone, but we're talking to somebody about them? And I don't know about you, I've done this many times. I used to be a high school teacher. When kids would bring a problem with another kid, I was like, hold on, let me go get that kid. And all of a sudden, the tone changes. Well, uh, 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 I mean, uh, 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 it's like, wait, 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 wait. If you can talk about them when they're not here, why don't you talk about them when they're in the room? Because they have a right to defend themselves. They have a right to have their own input and insight in this. It's fascinating to me that we have more conversations about other people, about other people, than we actually have the wee people that we need to have with. Honor people. There used to be an old school gospel singer named Carmen. I love Carmen. <laughs> Cheesy dude. But uh, he, had a, he had a line. He said, you can talk about me all that you want. I'll talk about you when I'm on my knees. Yeah. He keeps going. He says, look, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. I love that. Never be lacking in zeal, Keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Which, you know what this means? It translates this way. you got to learn to be self-motivated to serve God. In other words, you got to learn to be your own cheerleader. Everybody's busy, sister. Everybody's got this stuff going on. I can't be waiting on you to encourage me. Sometimes i got to encourage you as I encourage me. 
Listen, I don't preach to you. I preach to me first, and I hope he preaches to you as I'm preaching to myself first that I got to keep myself grounded and focused on serving God. I can't be focusing on what you have going on. I need to focus on what God has me doing. My friends, the devil is a liar. Don't you worry about other people's lives. You know what's interesting? The word zeal there in Arabic is the word Hamas. And I was studying, and this really jacked me up when I had this revelation. Wow. So Hamas is what happens when you are possessed by demonic spirits. Christianity is what happens when you are possessed by the Holy Spirit. And now your zeal becomes to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbors, you love yourself. To be filled with the Holy Spirit. To be able to produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, meekness, gentleness, self-control. That's what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. To have the fervor of the Lord. To have the zeal of God. That you're not going to become lukewarm. You're not going to become passive. You're not going to become another person that just goes to church. But you are activating your faith and you're living out your gospel in real time, in real life. Keeping your spiritual fervor. How's your passion? You can't teach passion. You can't teach passion. There's a lot of things you can try to teach, but man, man, it's hard to teach passion. Because passion comes from within, man. Passion comes from that fire. Like Jeremiah said, it shut up in my bones. I can't deny the Lord. I can't deny how good he is. I can't deny how faithful he is. I can't deny how awesome he is. Come hell or high water, I love you, Lord. I worship you, God. I live to please you. I live to serve you. I don't care what others have to say. My life belongs to you. My life is for your glory, for your honor, for your praise. Do you have passion to serve your God? Keep your spiritual fervor. You should see me in my car. I look crazy. Because <laughs> I have to preach to myself. If you pull up next to me, you're like, Pastor lost his mind. No, no. This is how Pastor keeps his mind sane by preaching to himself. And say, self, we're going to praise God. Self, we're going to worship God. Self, we're going to stay true to God. Come hell or oh, high water. I love you, Lord. <laughs> Are you passionate for Jesus? Man, people today will go to stadiums passionate about a football game and then go home with a broken heart. Because if you're a Patriots fan, you know what's coming. <laughs> That's all right. that, it, it, it has to be. We, I hate saying it, but it is what it is. <laughs> you got to be self-motivated. You got to be your own spiritual cheerleader. You got to be passionate. See, see, doing ministry takes a lot out of you. There's a research that was done that says the equivalent of preparing a message is like working an eight-hour shift. So today, by the time I'm done with this, this day, I've worked for 24 hours straight. But guess what? I love Jesus. I'll do it again next week if he allows me to. Every Monday I want to quit. Every Tuesday I'm back at it. Hello, somebody. You got to preach to yourself. You got to tell yourself that you're in this. And if I have a good day, my wife knows it's a Thai food kind of day. Because sometimes you got to honor yourself. You got to say, self, you're doing a good job too. Listen, don't self-criticize. Thank God for your life. There's such thing as negative self-prophecy. I don't know about you. I like me. I may have issues, but I like me. I thank God for me. I thank God for who I am. I thank God for how I do it. You may not like it, but I like it. I'm having Thai food today. <laughs> Look what Jesus says. Jesus says, this is his mission statement. Matthew, what's this? Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's where the spiritual fervor comes from. Jesus had haters. Jesus had people who didn't trust him. But guess what? He's like, man, I know my mission is to serve. It's to serve. When you're serving, man, you don't have time to play games. I love what Nehemiah said. Nehemiah, critics came in like, Nehemiah, no, people want to talk. He's like, man, I'm too busy. Too busy building this thing. I don't have time for that. 
Man, imagine living your life focused on serving the Lord and not having time for anything else. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Keep going. He says, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. I summarize it this way. Be hopeful, be patient, and be prayerful. Be hopeful. Hope is a powerful thing. Matter of fact, the Bible says three things will last. Faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love. Those are the three things that will remain. See, everybody is fighting a battle that you don't see. If we were to open up this place right now and ask you what's going on, you would say, man, I got, I got some stuff going on. I got some family issues. I got, I got marital problems. My kids are acting up. Or my finances are in a good place. My business is struggling. We all have something going on. That's why, my friends, you got to learn to be hopeful in the midst of despair. See, he says be transformed, not conform. Don't conform to the things around you. Right? And the way you do that is through these three things. Hopeful, patient, and prayerful. See, hope is the declaration that you've got to live by. My encouragement for you is this. Get up every day. If you got up, it's already a good day. And then make this declaration. Just simply say, God, you are good, and God, you are able. God, you are good, and God, you are able. Begin to start your day declaring things over your life. God, you are good, and you are able. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I trust that you're good, and you are able. Come on, say it with me. God, you are good, and God, you are able. Say it again. God, you are good. God, you are... Now give him some praise right in the midst of your struggle. Give him praise. Thank you, Lord. See, my friends, prayer is the fuel that builds your character and endurance. That's the main reason why we should pray. See, instead of complaining, pray. What is the complaining doing? Instead of whining, pray. Instead of posting, pray. Instead of wilding out, pray. My friends, instead of drinking, pray. Instead of getting high, pray, 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 and watch God turn it around for your good. Here's the thing. He doesn't always change the situation. He changes you to deal with the situation. That's what prayer does. God will increase. Watch this. This is, this is a heavy word. God will increase your pain threshold. Because if you're going to accomplish anything in life, you've got to learn to live in pain. No pain. No cross, no resurrection. So sometimes, listen, I dare you to believe this. How about you pray, God, increase my pain threshold because I want to be able to withstand whatever comes my way. Can you pray that? I dare you to pray that. God will increase your pain threshold. You know, there's an old saying in the church, new levels, new devils. So you better get your pain threshold up to be able to withstand the things that God wants for you. See, sometimes we pray for blessings, but you don't understand every blessing has a pain. You want to have a great marriage? Increase your pain threshold. You want to be a great parent? You you have no choice. Increase your pain (laughs) threshold. You want to have a business? Increase your pain threshold. You want to preach the gospel? You better increase your pain threshold. It's the only way you're going to make it. You know, we're triggered by everything now. We're just triggered. These kids are, you know, protesting. I was like, hey, I have a better idea. Let's take a field trip to Gaza. Let's see how you do in real time. If you're triggered by someone's post, watch bullets flying. Let's see how you make out. Friends, we got to stop cuddling our young people. Life does not give you breaks, okay? You either get a breakthrough or it breaks you. And I want to declare to you, you are stronger than you think you are. You are stronger than you think you are. You have no idea what you made up until you go through it and you don't give up and you don't quit and you stay in it. You are stronger than you. I declare that you are more than a conqueror because of Jesus Christ. You can do all things through Christ who gives you 
the strength to get through it. If he brought it to you, he will find a way to get you through it. You are stronger than you think you are. Give him praise in the middle of your challenges. Thank you, Lord. I am definitely getting Thai food today. <laughs> My last point today is be generous. The Bible says share with the Lord's people what we need. Practice hospitality. Be generous. Nothing more beautiful than a generous person. The Bible says it is more blessed to give than to receive. See, that's the mystery, right? The more you give, the actually the more you receive. It's amazing how that works. Give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, run over. Surely your goodness and mercy will follow me every day of my life. I'm telling you, the more generous you are, the more blessed you are. Hospitality here is talking about like welcoming strangers. Learning to make a community become a family. Pay attention to your neighbors. Pay attention to people at the grocery store. Pay attention to people at Dunkin' Donuts. Like, you can practice hospitality wherever you are. Listen, we get more work done with God when we have a generous heart. A healthy church is a generous church. I'm going to brag on this church because it's amazing. This church is so generous, it blows my mind. Listen. (laughs) We may have issues. We got 99 problems, but generosity ain't one. Tell you that right. <laughs> Let me testify about this church. We haven't passed an offering bucket since 2020, but we haven't missed our bills. We've taken care of everything that we needed to take care of. By the way, with no help from the government, the people of this house is generous. Every week, we take care of over 100 families in the food pantry, week after week. Every day, without a word of a lie, the office helps people in many ways, paying their, paying their mortgages, paying whatever is happening, fires happen in the city. You know who calls us? The city calls and says, we know you guys are generous. You will help. My friends, thank God for a generous church. <laughs> Salvation is free, but everything else costs. You know you're sitting on $20,000 a month. Oh, you didn't know that. And you're over here like, the church just wants my money. No, listen, you better contribute because there's a greater thing happening here that's actually going to bless your life. <laughs> don't get it twisted. Someone pay for that chair you're sitting on. Someone pay for this, whatever's, I don't know, if you feel the air. Maybe you didn't pay that this month, I don't know. But <laughs> it costs, my friends. Thank God for a generous church who loves Jesus Christ. I don't know about you. I love this community. My mind's made up. This is my community. I'm grateful for this community. Come on, stand with me. Let's thank God for this day. This is only possible by the Holy Spirit. Like, I, we can't live this without the Holy Spirit. We don't have what it takes. We're too selfish. We're too grumpy to live this way. I need the Holy Spirit. That's the only way to do this. So I want to pray for the Holy Spirit to come upon us. Would you bow your heads with me and lift your hands? Father, we pray right now, Holy Spirit, come. Everything we just shared is only possible through you. Fill us, Lord. Fill us so that we don't just hear your word, but we are doers of your word. Holy Spirit, come fill us, Lord, so that we may live generous lives. Fill us so that we may learn to honor one another. Fill us so that we may be humble. Fill us so that our eyes are filled with humility and our pride. Fill us, Lord, so that our ears only listen to blessings and not curses. Fill us, Lord, that our hands and feet will be a blessing to those we meet. Would you pray that, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Produce in me what only you can. Only you can produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, meekness, gentleness, perseverance, and self-control. Fill your people, Lord. We need you. Fill us so that our marriages are blessed. 
Fill us so that our parenting is blessed. Fill us so our business, our, our workplace is blessed. Fill us so that this church continues to be a blessing in tangible ways. Fill us, we pray. I'm going to invite the prayer team to come. Listen, come and sit with the Holy Spirit. Let him, let him marinate your soul. Yesterday, the men were so filled with the Holy Spirit, man. It was powerful to see men, you know, layers, onions being peeled back. That's what God does. He peels back. The only way the man can do that is by the power of the Holy Spirit. So come spend some time with the presence of God. The altar's open. Let's, let's continue to worship. <laughs>